Okay, welcome to another lesson from Skurb Dog's Tabletop. What are we going to get into today? I got me a blank piece of paper, just trying to get comfy here. How about we talk about, because it's about to get real here in cyber school. Well, at least before it gets real, let's talk about, hmm, let me see. Let's talk about the naming of muscles. Because everything we've done up to this point has just been pre-game to the real game. We're actually going to go through a very large number of muscles and a lot of content about them. So it might be helpful if we start out talking about how they're named. Now, what I'm about to do is really a general overview. Most muscles are named in one of these ways, but it could be a combination of all of the ways, or there's always some anomalies that really don't follow the set. So let's go over some common ways that muscles are named. You guys kind of get the drift of what I'm talking about. Number one, the first way in which muscles are named is the direction of fibers. And if you don't remember this word, whoop, I forgot of, direction of fibers. If you don't remember that word, go back and look up muscle fiber in that general anatomy review. Might have been the first or second lesson in this, uh, in this unit. So some muscles are named for the direction of their fiber. So over here, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to put a dotted line over here. And this is going to represent the sagittal plane. Anybody remember what that means? The sagittal plane is the line, the imaginary line, that cuts you directly in half and with, I'm sorry, into two equal parts with the exception of internal organs. So let's go with the first one. You might see as we go over muscles the word rectus. Rectus refers to the direction of fibers. And rectus means uh, straight up and down. So these fibers will be running straight up and down relative to the sagittal plane. So I'm going to put an up arrow right there. Okay. The next one is the word transverse. If you see that word in the name of a muscle, it refers to the direction of fibers. And transverse means to go from side to side. So these fibers will run this way. So rectus abdominis is running up and down. So I'll put a little R right there so you have a reference point. And transverse means they're running from side to side. So we got up and down, side to side. What's left? Well, you guessed it. There's a science word called oblique. If you see that word in the name of a muscle, it means the fibers are running at an angle, some type of angle to the mid-sagittal plane. So I'll put... It's going to either run that way or could run this way. Could go up, could go down, just depends on what muscle it is. So some muscles are named for the direction of fibers. Examples include rectus, transverse, and oblique. And that wouldn't be the whole name. That would just be a part of it. And that's the nice thing about muscle naming is that every single muscle name tells you something about the muscle. And in some cases, it tells you everything you need to know. We'll go over that as we get into them. Number two, some muscles are named for their location. Now, when you name a muscle in this manner, not that you're naming them, when we name, well, no, that's not true either because I didn't name any muscles. When muscles are named, if they're named for location, it's always with reference to the belly of the muscle. Does anybody remember what that was? Does anybody remember? If you remember, look, if you had this expanded thing right here, you know, and that was the muscle like that. Whoops. We had a tendon on each end. And then the muscle expands in the center. What's that center part called? Oh, let me guess. The belly. So anytime a muscle is named for a location, the reference point is where the belly of the muscle is lying, not the ends, the dead center of it. So let's just do, I mean, there's lots of these. I'm just do a couple of examples, okay? These are real muscles. And you'll know that because I'll always put a little M after it. Temporalis muscle. That's the name of the whole muscle. This muscle is named for its location. So if its name is temporalis, where do you think it's located? Any Bones fans out there? I know I can't hear you. That's the part I hate about distance learning. I wish you were all in the room because then we could say funny stuff and make each other laugh. Ah, very good. I heard it. The temporal bone. Temporal. Wait, I don't think that spells right. I didn't spell that right. I still don't think that's spelled right. Ah, oh, you get my point. The temporal bone, where's that? Ah, it's on the side of your skull. 
So where's this muscle? Oh, I don't know if it's named for its location and the temporal bone's on the side of your skull. This muscle's on the side of your skull. So what I want you to do, and I can't do this on camera, take, your, take four fingers, put them above your ear, because that's where the temporal bone is. You guys remember that. Put them above, I'm putting my hands above my ear right now. You do it. Four fingers, put them lightly against your head. Don't press too hard. And then clench your teeth. You should feel a muscle contracting on the side of your head. That muscle is the temporalis muscle. And we're going to go over it. It actually helps to elevate the jaw and increase your power. So that's example, whoops, sorry, that's example one. Let's do example two. Sorry about the messy notes. Yours will just be nicer when you do them, right? Can you see that? Yep, perfect. All right, the second one. This is the name of a real muscle named for its location. The muscle's name is tibialis anterior. So what does this bone, oh, sorry, what, the, what does that name refer to? That's the tibia. Where's the tibia? Uh, largest bone in the lower leg. And anterior, that's a directional term that means front. So I wonder where this muscle is located. It's the front of the tibia. It's the large muscle on the lateral surface of your shin, tibialis anterior, on the front of the tibia. And there's other muscles named for location. And as we get to them, we'll come back and make reference to this instruction, okay? Let's go to number three. So we get a new page here. The next way in which muscles are named is the size of the muscle. So you'll see references. A lot of time they're gonna use size references when you have multiple muscles in the same area doing the, relatively the same thing or working in groups, they'll use size reference to differentiate them. For example, okay? For example, you might see this word, maximus. What does that word mean? That word means big. That means big. Okay, and then I want you to skip, uh, skip a line put a dot, skip a line, put a dot, and you better be taking notes. You're going to need these for the next test, I'm telling you. Even online, this is a big one. So maximus means big. There's another size reference in muscle naming, which is minimus. What's that mean? That means little. Sorry about the horrible accent. And then there's something in the middle. Something, there's maximus, minimus, and then you'll see this word, medius. And what does that mean? Well, it's somewhere in between. So I'm going to use the word medium. So you have a big one, a medium, and a little one. You're going to see this in your gluteus muscles, your glutes. So you got the big, large one on your butt. That's gluteus maximus. And then you have two hip flexors high on the hip above your butt muscle called gluteus medius and gluteus minimus, all in a group. Another example, let's do example two. You might see this reference, longus. Hmm, I wonder what that means long. And then the opposite of that is brevis. And that means short, which comes from the word brevity through the word brief, which means, you guessed it, short. So you might see some size references out there. Okay. Number four, another common way in which muscles are named are the number of origins. Now, everybody has to go back in their notes and tell me what the origin is. Hmm. Origin. Origin. Oh, I remember. That's the end that stays still and acts as what? An anchor. Now, that's already in your notes. You don't have to write that again if you don't want to, but I just want to have it there as a reference point while we talk about these ones. Now, here's the cool thing. Origins, you can have more than one. Insertion points, it's one because you can't have one muscle doing two things. It's very confusing. But origins, you can definitely have more than one origin. If you have two anchors, what you're doing is just increasing the big L. What is the big L? Oh, sorry, my knee just hit the table. The big L is leverage from a previous lesson. So some muscles are named for their number of origins. So I'm gonna put a real muscle name down, and then somebody out there in the cyber world, you scream out the answer, okay? I wanna hear it. Make sure you scream really loud, okay? Ah, let me see this. Biceps brachii. That's a real muscle. So it's, it, now this is a combo name here. The biceps is the number of origins. Brachii is a location reference. The brachii means or refers to brachium, which is the upper arm. That's your humerus. I wanted to get one joke in there. I hope you guys thought that was funny. It's humerus. Get it? Humerus. <laughs> Not that funny. Okay, sorry. I digress. Biceps brachii, how many heads of origin? Oh, I don't know, two. 
And then there's another muscle, triceps brachii. Triceps brachii. How many heads of origin? Uh, uh, let me, three. Look how easy it is. How about this one? Whoops, forgot to have that. Quadriceps femoris, which is technically a muscle group, but how many heads of origin? Four. Pretty easy. So some muscles are named for the number of origins. Let me throw this piece of paper out. Hope you had that. One last look and get out of here. She gone. Clean slate. Fix my papers. Uh, number five. Some muscles are named for their shape. Okay, now you guys are going to have to figure this one out. I'll give you some examples. Okay, deltoid. Deltoid, oid means like. Delt is from the uh, Latin letter delta. What is delta? You guys remember delta G, change in free energy from chemistry? Delta. The deltoid muscle is shaped like a triangle, which is the letter delta. Yay! Okay. And then there's another one. You might see this. Trapezius. What's a trapezius shaped like? A trapezoid. So I know the big trapezius muscle on your back is shaped like a kite, so a modified four-sided figure. Okay, so you might see some muscles named for shape, and there are some other ones, but we will get into those as we go through all the muscles that we need to know for the exam. Okay, number six. Some muscles are named for their origin and insertion. Now, I love these ones because if you know the origin insertion, you know the muscle's name, and you know everything it's due, and you know its attachment points. It's like one-stop shopping. This is like the Walmart of uh, muscle naming right here. Let me give you an example, okay? Sterno, Clido, Mastoid. This is a real muscle. Now, if you guys remember in your cat while we were still doing your cat, this is two muscles in the cat. It is the sternomastoid muscle and clidomastoid muscle. But in humans, it's got two heads of origin wrapped with one piece of connective tissue. La, 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 right? Now, when you name a muscle in this case, the last reference, so you see sterno, that's a reference, clido, that's a reference, and mastoid, that's a reference. The last one, and there can only be one. If you've ever seen the movie Highlander, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, there can only be one. The insertion is always the last word. So what's the insertion point for this muscle? The mastoid process. And this is where if you don't know bones, you're going to wish you did. Okay, now there's still two remaining references. So if this is the insertion, what are these two remaining references? Well, those are the origins, plural. And remember, you can have more than one origin. You can only have one insertion. So sterno, what's that refer to? Sternum. Clido, what's that refer to? Clavicle. And these are all references we made before in class. So we have two origins, one insertion. So the sternocleidomastoid is named for everything that it is. And then I'm going to teach you, if you know all of this, you also know the action of the muscle and what it can do. Pretty cool. Let me give you another example. Hyoglossus. Hyoglossus. Now look, hyo is one reference. Glossus is the other reference. So we always start at the end. So what is the insertion point? Glossus, you could look this up on the internet, but I'll save you the time because I already know it. Glossus means tongue. Very good. Tongue. And then hyo, what do you think hyo refers to? Everybody knows this one. It's that weird little bone right under your mandible, doesn't articulate with any other bones, helps to move and support the tongue. That'd be the hyoid bone. So that's the origin. That's the insertion. Hyoglossus. Now, here's the other cool thing. So when you go back, well, let's just start with this one. What's moving? If the insertion point is the end that's move, that moves, what's moving? The tongue. The tongue is going to move. So here, what's going to move? The mastoid process. Well, the mastoid process is just a lump off of the temporal bone. So what's going to move? Your whole head. And this is going to be really critically important when we start learning how muscles move the body around. Okay, last one, I promise. Last one. Try to keep the instruction under 15, 16 minutes. The last one is action. Some muscles are named for what they do. So you're going to see action words in their name. For example, you might see the word flexor. 
Well, what action does a flexor, a flexor create? Uh, flex. What is flexing? You remember in that one lesson? That's the decreasing the angle at a joint. Watch, I'll do it with my elbow. Ready? Flexion. 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 Just like that. What's the opposite of flexion? Extension. Increasing the angle at a joint. You'll see the word extensor. That's the noun, extensor. So you might see that as part of the name. You might see levator. What does levator mean? That means to elevate, not levitate. That's a different word. Although it'd be really cool if I could levitate. Elevate, which way is that? That's any body part going up, up. All right, and then there's another one called a sphincter. What's a sphincter do? You guys already know this. The sphincter controls the diameter of a circular opening. Sphincter says what? <laughs> what? Sphincter says what? Does anybody know that movie? It's really funny. Sphincter says what? So, and, and again, there are more examples to all of these, but we're going to leave a little bit of a surprise and as we get to muscles, we'll talk about how each one is named and look at its Latin references. I think it's easier to understand muscles and remember them if you know a little bit of Latin. It's a lot easier. So that's the lesson for today on how muscles are named. And I don't know if you guys know this, but the next lesson, we're going to start with muscles of facial expression. So I may actually be diving into the camera like that to show you some of my facial expressions. I guess I'll have to do that upside down. It'll be cool. But until then, have a great weekend, and I'll see you next time.